As you know, before the Prophet ﷺ renamed it to Medina, it used to be known as Yathrib. And the scholars say that Yathrib was the name of a man who was from the descendants of Nuh salam. And he founded this city and therefore they named it after him, Yathrib. They say the, the earliest three inhabitants, the first were the Amalika, they're known as the Amalekites. So they were people that were huge, they were large in size. So we've got the Amalika, then we've got the Jews. The Jews came to Medina a very long time ago also, and the scholars believe that they were descendants of immigrants from Palestine. The earliest of the Jewish tribes that came to the city of Medina were Banu Qurayla, the scholars say, and Banu Nadir. These two are the, of the earliest Jewish tribes. Then the third group of the early inhabitants of the city were the Aus and the Khazraj, the famous tribes, the Aus and the Khazraj. And there are two tribes from Qahtan that were originally from Yemen. And of course, until the time of the Prophet ﷺ, these two tribes were still there. Now, the Prophet ﷺ changed the name from Yathrib to Medina. And the scholars speculate as to why. They give some explanations. They say because in Arabic, so Yathrib, Tathrib in Arabic means to blame. It also linguistically means to corrupt or to adulterate something. So you can see it doesn't have a very good connotation. So the Prophet ﷺ then uh, changed his name to Medina. This also has other names. Uh, there is uh, Taba in the Hadith in Sahih al-Bukhari. Prophet said, indeed Allah the Almighty, the All-Powerful named it Taba. And the scholars say that Taba, Tayba also named Tayba, are all from Tayyib because it has been purified from shirk. Now, uh, with regards to some of the virtues, just some of the virtues, first of all, it's the location of the Hijrah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And then, uh, the Prophet said in Sahih Bukhari and also in Sahih Muslim that the Prophet said that I've been enjoined to go to a city that supersedes all other cities. They say Yathrib, but it is Medina. And then the Prophet described something about it that it purifies people as the bellows eliminates the impurities of iron. And another hadith describes how whatever wicked type of person comes to the city, they leave it and Allah replaces them with a better person. This is towards the end of time until the best of people are living in al Medina. Another one of its uh, amazing things is that the Dajjal cannot enter the city of al Medina. So he will just camp outside of al Medina and then he will stand on uh, uh, like a small hill and he will point to it. The hadith says, he will say to his companions, the Antichrist, the Dajjal, do you see that white palace over there? And he will tell them that is the Masjid of Ahmad. And it's such a beautiful hadith because this hadith, at the time, the masjid of the Prophet ﷺ was brown, earth tone in color. And only a genuine prophet would know the color of his masjid in the distant future. And today, if you look at the masjid of Nabawi, just physically, or an aerial shot, or even a satellite shot. And what's the color? Bright white, white marble everywhere. So, the Dajjal tells them, do you see that white palace? That is the masjid of Ahmad. He's not able to enter the city of Medina every time... At every gate, there's an angel with a sword drawn out. And so that the Dajjal will not be able to enter it. But he needs to get the evil people out of it. The earth will be, meaning the, the, the land, the ground will shake three times violently. And every hypocrite, male or female, would leave out and join the Dajjal. But him entering physically, he will not be able to. There's some other things, يعني, the Prophet said also in Sahih Bukhari and Muslim, that no one plots against the people of Medina except that Allah will cause him to, to, to dissolve as salt dissolves in water. Yani Allah is protecting the people of the city from wh whoever tries to plot against them. Now, sorry, I want to go back to the hadith of Medina superseding all the cities. So immediately you think, what about Mecca? So Imam al nawawi and other scholars explained it. They said that it can supersede them in another way. Can we agree that, for example, the conquering of Mecca, the army that left, and the people that left to conquer Mecca, where did they leave from? Medina. In that sense, isn't it superior that it's the city from which all other cities will be conquered? So they said in that sense, not in the sense of its, its actual virtues and, and place in, in front of Allah Azza wa But we do know the Prophet said in the hadith that the, a prayer in 
يعني, in this masjid or in my masjid is better than a thousand prayers in any other masjid except for al-masjid al-haram. So this is just a little bit of the virtues of al-masjid al-nabawi or in the haram al-nabawi itself and its sanctuary. So al-masjid al-nabawi was the second masjid that was built in the first year of the hijrah. The first one was the masjid of Quba, and it was the first masjid and it was on the way to Medina. So the Prophet ﷺ stopped at Quba, built this masjid and then continued on his way to the city of Medina. And when he entered Medina, the Ansar started to take the reins of the she-camel, of the naqa of the Prophet ﷺ. So he would be their guest. And then the Prophet ﷺ told them, basically, leave the camel alone. It is commanded, meaning it's commanded by Allah to go to a specific place. So everybody let go of the camel and it kept walking until it settled. It kneeled down near the home of Abu Ayyub al-Ansari. It kneeled in that place. And the Prophet ﷺ said, this is the place, inshaAllah. The second day, the Prophet ﷺ comes and he asked, who does this land belong to? It was a flat land where they used to dry dates. And there were a few neglected palm trees and a few old graves of some pagans. And just piles and rubbles of sand here and there. So the Prophet ﷺ asked, who, to whom does this land belong? And they said it belongs to two orphans from Bani Najjar. In a, in a hadith, the Prophet ﷺ says, O Bani Najjar, give me a price. Yani, I want to buy the land. So the two orphan boys actually offered to give the land for free. We donate it. Especially the masjid is going to be built here. But the Prophet ﷺ refused. He refused to take it as a gift. And he insisted on giving them a price. Then Abu Bakr paid the amount. So 10 gold dinar is what they bought the land for. And Abu Bakr anhu paid it. So the Prophet ﷺ asked the companions now to prep this area for construction of a masjid. East of the masjid, there was a, a place known as Baqi' al-Khabkhaba. And it was a place where this, they decided to basically, this is where they're going to build all the bricks for the construction of the masjid. So it's almost like a brick factory now to the east of the masjid. They'll build all the bricks there and lay them out to dry. Then when they're ready, they bring them to the masjid. And it's close enough. They don't have to like travel a far distance. Uh, so they started then to prep this area. And we're, we're going to look at some of the numbers and some of the procedures for building the masjid. One of the things, the Prophet ﷺ marked on the ground the size of this masjid. So it's going to be 35 meters by 35 meters. And... The Qibla is towards Bayt al-Maqdis at this point. There were three doors. One door in the south, one door in the west. It is known as Bab al-Rahma. And then one door in the east. And this is the one the Prophet would use frequently. And we said because the Qibla was in the north, there was no door there. And uh, they, would, they would build it with bricks. And the Prophet himself would be taking part in the building. So he didn't just sit and tell people, you do this, you move faster. But he himself, and he would put the bricks on his garment. And when the companions saw that, they started to do the same. They would pick, they were big bricks. They would put them on their, their garment and bring them to the, or the location of the building. What they did was, they, they made first a foundation of only rocks, one and a half meters deep. And then on top of this foundation of rocks, going deep in the ground, and then on top of the rocks, they put the bricks. And the bricks were like three-fourths of a meter thick. So they were quite thick and big, these and we're calling them bricks. We don't imagine this little brick that we have now in our houses. Then uh, the, the pillars inside the masjid, like these pillars here, they were made from trunks of palm trees standing there. And the, the roof they made from are the palm stalks. So if you look at a palm tree, you've got the long part that has the leaves at the end, the green part. This long part, you remove the leaves from that, you've got these almost like long stick-like pieces. So they set those up top like that the leaves of the palm tree. They put that on top, and then they put a layer of mud on top. And the mud was to stop the rain from seeping through. But it wasn't all covered. So the ceiling, they described, like, was almost like almost the height of a human being. So they say it was about two meters high, the ceiling itself. And the ceiling was a meter shorter than the walls. The walls were three meters tall, and the ceiling was, bring down one meter, and that's the ceiling. And it wasn't all covered. Front part was covered, and then the majority of it was open, and then the back part was covered again. And that was the, the that area was where the people of Asufa, the poor, and would say, it took, some narrations say, one month to build the masjid. Others say seven months, 
And the longest narration says it took a year to fully complete building the masjid. So this was now the masjid the Prophet ﷺ completed. That's its size. That's what it looks like roughly. This was what it looked like in the beginning when the Prophet ﷺ built the masjid. So after 16 months, after the Prophet ﷺ built the masjid, after 16 months, the qibla was changed. And when the qibla was changed, the following changes happened to the masjid. So first the qibla was towards the north, right? And Mecca is south of Medina. So now the qibla is changing from towards the north to the south. Now, one of the things used to bother the Muslims, the Jews used to taunt the Muslims and they used to tell them, if we were not upon the truth, you wouldn't be facing our qibla. And the Prophet ﷺ also wanted, yani in his heart, he wanted the qibla to change. And then the verses came down and the qibla changed, so exactly the opposite. Then we come to the first expansion. And the first expansion was during the time of the Prophet ﷺ, in the seventh year after the hijrah, after uh, the conquering of Khaybar. And now there were more and more people coming to Islam and the population was getting bigger and the masjid was getting too small and too tight. So the people asked the Prophet ﷺ to expand the masjid and Nabi ﷺ complied and agreed. Next to the masjid was this empty space of land. Uh, the Prophet ﷺ wanted the, asked his companions to purchase it. Uthman ibn Affan, anhu, he went and he bought it, all of the land, and he donated it to the masjid. Uthman anhu, completely paid for the land gave it to the masjid. So the changes that were made was that the, the door in the south, that door was closed off because now we're praying that way. And they opened another door in the north and then they moved Ahl Sufa, their area, from the front to the back. And Muhim, everything is reversed. Does that make it easier? So now we're going back to the first expansion when Uthman bought the land and the Prophet then expanded it so to the north and south. It, from, from the north to the south, southern tip of the masjid is 50 meters now. So they increased 15 meters extra. And remember, it was 35 meters wide. It's now 45 meters wide. So 10 meters wider. So not a huge expansion, right? And at night, they would light the masjid with, with branches of palm trees. So they were like torches inserted into a wall or into a pillar. But then the companion, Tamim al-Dari, he brings, he brings these lanterns and ropes and oil and he hung up these lanterns in the masjid and lit up lit them up with with the oil now so now the masjid was illuminated in a much better way and it was much brighter than than before and the prophet was so pleased with that and he tells him you illuminated our masjid may allah bring light for you so the prophet didn't have a member back then so he would stand next to one of these palm trunks and he would lean on it and he would speak to the companions from there. And then the, the standing was, give, give him a hard time. So he asked different narrations. One, he asked the companions to build some kind of mimbar for him. Another explanation is that he, one of the Ansari women, her son was a carpenter. So he told her to have her son build something for him. And he built this mimbar and it was three steps. And the Prophet then started to give the, the speech from the mimbar. And the palm tree he used to lead, lean upon, and it's not a living palm tree, but the, the trunk of it, the pillar, started to, to make a sound like the crying of, of a camel, like a small camel when it loses its mother. This event, and many companions were, were in the masjid, and everyone knew where the sound was coming from. It's not like someone was like, where is that from? And some people next to it knew it was this thing. Everybody knew it was that palm trunk. But what is beautiful is that one of the narrations says that it was so sad that the companions became sad. They just felt bad for it, the way it was crying. Because the Nabi wasallam wasn't leaning on it anymore with his blessed body. So the Prophet then, if you could just see him, he gets off the mimbar and he goes to console this inanimate object. And he talks to it and he tells it that if you wish, I can make dua for you and greenery will return. You will become green again. And you can live again. Or if you wish, I will make dua for you to become one of the trees of Al-Jannah. And the trunk became quiet. Did not make any more noise after that. That was the second expansion at the, at the time of the Prophet. No expansion at the time of Abu Bakr. At the time of Umar, عنه, numbers increased also. And they asked Umar to enlarge and to rebuild the masjid. Uh, there was land nearby, belonged to some of the Ansar. 
So it was bought from some of them, some of them donated it for the masjid, and some of them, and it basically, uh, ownership was taken from them because this was something urgent, kind of like eminent domain, right? And this time it's 70 meters long and made wider as well. And now the, me the ceiling was made much higher. It was five meters. So this is quite high now, almost I mean, more than double what it used to be at the time of the Prophet. And then they put soft pebbles I mean, or, or like small pebbles all over. This was the, the carpeting that they had back then. And this was, I mean, there was a place called Wadi Al-Aqiq. So it's a valley nearby that had this, these fine pebbles and they put them all over the masjid. And that's why also I mean, they used to enter the masjid in, with their sandals, with their shoes. Yeah, and they added doors, they added more doors to it. This was during the reign of Umar. Then, during the time of Uthman, in the fourth year, so four years he's the Khalifa, then the people started asking him again, the masjid is too tight, please make it bigger. So, 80 meters long, 50 meters wide, and he only added 10 meters to the length and 10 meters to, to the width. But what was really unique about this expansion is that Uthman who had the walls built out of rock. So all the walls now were rock, solid rock. And the pillars were made of rock as well. And some of them had iron يعني, as a reinforcement. And the interesting thing now, the walls became white. They didn't have paint, but they used plaster. Now, then other expansions. And these are the interesting ones, like I said. But during Al Walid, the time of Al Walid bin Abdul -Wal Al Malik, this is the 88th year after the Hijrah. And this expansion will continue until, and, and it will finish on the year 91 after the Hijrah. So the year 88 after the Hijrah, Al Walid ibn Abdul Malik, he asked his governor in charge in Medina, and that governor was Umar ibn Abdul Aziz, who will later on become the Khalifa himself. He tells him, expand the Masjid of the Prophet and incorporate the rooms of the wives of the Prophet into the Masjid. So now when he include the room of Aisha into the Masjid, the grave of the Prophet because he's buried in the room of Aisha, is going to be inside the masjid as well. So we've got these issues. One, incorporating the grave of the Prophet into the masjid. Two, we're going to destroy all the homes of the, of the mothers of the believers. When that, the letter came to Umar ibn Abdul Aziz, he gathered all the, the nobles and he gathered all the scholars and he read it to them. And everyone was displeased. Sayyid ibn Musayyib, one of the great scholars from the Tabi'een, he said no, and he was against it. He was afraid that the grave of the Prophet ﷺ would eventually be worshipped by people. That's why he was against it. And others were against the destruction of the homes of the mothers of the believers. Six feet by six feet, and there's just nothing in them. And Aisha, did, her whole life was inside that room, this tiny little space. And all the knowledge that she disseminated to the world from this little room. So... Umar ibn Abdul Aziz writes back to him saying, uh, I consulted with people and everything and everybody's against it. Yani we don't like this idea. So Al-Walid ibn Abdul Malik writes him back, just do what you're commanded. So they tear down the, the rooms of the wives of the Prophet ﷺ. Very emotional day. They said, people who were alive at that time, they said that people cried in Medina as loud as when the day when the Prophet ﷺ died. That's how sad it was for them. People were sitting crying in the masjid saying, we wish we could leave it. So people and visitors from different parts of the world, يعني, the hujjaj and everything, could come and see what sufficed the Prophet and his wives. What simple life they had, how small it was, how there was nothing of, of value or of substance inside. They wanted to leave it so that we could encourage people to have zuhd and to not want so much of the materialism and of this dunya. So they were saddened and crying as these homes were being destroyed. The, the new expansion now is going to include the homes and the, of the wives of the Prophet ﷺ. They're going to build walls around Al-Ghurfa. Al-Ghurfa is the house of Aisha, the room of Aisha, where the Prophet ﷺ is buried. They're going to build uh, w walls around it with rocks. And there will be no doors going into this room. So it's solid walls. No doors, no openings. And then uh, they're going to buy the land next to it and for this expansion. And then uh, Umar ibn Abdul Aziz built minarets in every corner so the four corners four minarets and they were square shaped and then the the member was already raised he actually remember that was three steps he added six more so the member now became longer and you would see you would be seated at the ninth step so this is when members start to get long more people now can see that the the masjid is bigger the audience is bigger
So the higher you are, the more they can see you. Now, but the room where the Prophet was buried, the room of, of Aisha, but, the, but Umar ibn Abdul Aziz built another wall around it. There's some very nice models of this. He built another wall with a very obscure shape around it, like a hexagon, and has a very obscure shape to it. And for a number of reasons. One, the area near the Qibla, he wanted to have these two diagonally pointed out walls so nobody could face it, face the grave in, uh, and the Qibla. You'd have to turn his angle and you would be missing the, the, not able to worship the grave, to prevent the worship of the grave. The second thing, he didn't want it to look like the Kaaba. And the Prophet instructed, Masajid and graves don't mix. Yani even Janazah prayer, we don't bow, we don't prostrate. So it doesn't mix. And if there's a grave in a masjid, we see which was first. If the grave was first, then the masjid is destroyed. And if the, the masjid was first and the grave entered later, then the grave is exhumed. We don't mix the two. But some people now try to use a masjid al Nabawi as, as an excuse or a reason to put graves in masjid. The scholars say a number of things. Number one, the Sahaba did not bury the Prophet in, the, in his masjid. They buried him in his home. Then, during the time of Abdul Malik ibn Marwan, he, ex he ordered that the expansion of the masjid includes the grave of the Prophet The scholars at the time objected to it, and they didn't agree, and until today they say, well, it was wrong to do that. But it happened, that's one. Then the other thing is that it is not directly in front of the Qibla, or it's not in front of, of the Musalleen. And then the other thing is that the truth is it is not being worshipped, even though some people now and then try to worship. But in general, if you look at Ummat Muhammad وسلم, and you look at all the things that are worshipped and all the graves that are worshipped I mean, one study said in one Muslim country alone we don't want to mention it, Egypt <laughs> 5,000 graves are, are, are worshipped just one country yeah. so you look at all the kinds of things that are worshipped if you consider you know, the, what's really happening with the Masjid of the Prophet it's really not being worshipped by people and that was the dua of the Prophet on his deathbed, that his grave would not be uh, something that would be worshipped. Some of the interesting things, in the year 160 after the Hijrah, Al-Mahdi the Khalifa, he visited Medina and ordered another expansion, but only from the north. So they bought some land around it, and the expansion started in the year 161 after the Hijrah. It continued for five years. They added, they have a total now of 24 doors. And then we got to two burnings in, this, in the year 654 after the Hijrah. In the first of Ramadan, this is during the time of the Mamluks, the masjid burnt and the ceiling uh, of the masjid, many parts of the ceilings collapsed and even inside this, the room of the Prophet ﷺ. Just repairs were done at this point, not rebuilding. But the second burning was in the year 886 after the Hijrah. But at this point, it burned completely. Some lightning struck one of the minarets and it burnt, and the rest of the masjid caught on fire. They said everything, يعني, the pillars, the mimbar, the, the dome, and uh, everything except the only thing that survived was the dome inside the hujra. So this room where the Prophet, Prophet and Abu Bakr and Umar are buried, there is actually a small dome on top, of, in, like inside this room. The green dome is actually... The, the thing about the green dome in the Masjid al-Nabawi is that it's the dome right above the small white dome that's inside the Hujra where the Prophet is, is buried. Everything burned except for that white, white dome, basically. And so, at this point, completely rebuilt. Now, some of the interesting stories, Nur al-Din Zinki, so one of the leaders of, uh, of the Muslims during the Crusades, he had a dream. In his dream, the Prophet came to him and he said, Save me from these two people. And then he showed him two blonde people in his dream. So he got up, he made wudu, he prayed at night, he fell back asleep, saw the exact same dream. Prophet comes to him and says, save me from these two people. He consults someone and the person says, what are you waiting for? Go to Medina right now. When he arrives in Medina, the governor tells people, Nur al-Din Zinki is coming to visit in Medina and he's bringing gifts for everyone so everybody come to the gathering. So they gathered and this is the majority of the inhabitants of the city, gave everyone gifts. He says, did anyone not show up to receive gifts? He said, yes. There are two people who didn't show up. Now he's interested in them. He says, who are these two people? They said, there are two people who are, who are very generous. They recently moved to the city from Al-Maghrib, yani the western part of the empire. And uh, they're very generous. They visit Al-Baqi'ah every single day. They're always giving. And they, 
And so he says, okay, I want to meet those two people. He sees them, and they're the exact two people from the dream. So he starts to ask them, what's your story? Well, we just came from Al-Maghrib, and we want to live near the Hujra, the room of the Prophet ﷺ. He, he goes into their home. And, and, and the, I mean, everyone thinks they're righteous because they show, show signs of righteousness and generosity, and they're very wealthy. So there's nothing in the room of, except like, I will like a straw mat, shukran. He moves it, and there's a tunnel. And they're right next to the Hujra. They, their house is right next to the Hujra. They've been tunneling underground to steal the body of the Prophet ﷺ. And that's why I kept coming to him in the dream saying, save me from these two. People from Al-Maghrib back then, they used to have these huge leather pouches. So nobody thought of them as suspicious. They would put the sand from the digging in these pouches and then go dump it in Al-Baqi'ah. That's why they're visiting Al-Baqi'ah every day. They're dumping the sand from the digging, the excavation. And they actually got very close, basically to the grave of the Prophet ﷺ. That night when they got close, there was like thunder, you know, striking in the, the, the city. And that's the same night that Nur uh, arrived. And so he actually he beat them. He had them beaten until they admit. They said, we were Christians. Because remember, this is Crusades time. So we were Christians that were sent by the Christians of, of Al-Maghrib. And we were basically to steal the, the body of the Prophet ﷺ. But then Nur began to cry a lot. He cried so much. Why? Because the Prophet ﷺ chose him from all the people in the Ummah. And there were other leaders and Salatin and governors. But he chose him. He said, save me and help me, from, protect me from these two people. And that's why he cried so much. Because what an honor. The Prophet ﷺ chose him. And so that was one of those incidents uh, that was a big deal. Uh, well, first of all, the Hujra now, the people who go and clean that area, they're not janitors today. They're actually like high-ranking individuals and big shots and officials and they go and clean it. Why? Because they wanted to contain the nonsense. So in the old days when janitors would be in charge of those areas, they would sell dust to people. The last thing I want to see very quickly, that the, the last person to enter the, the hujra is actually, uh, this was during, uh, in 1881. So remember Umar ibn Abdul Aziz built a hexagonal or pentagon uh, shaped wall outside. One of those walls fell, it collapsed. And when they looked, they saw one of the hujra walls leaning over like this also. So now we've got to rebuild both. And they had a committee put together and they reconstructed both walls. One of the people who saw it wasn't a nobody. This was a, a scholar, and a, well, a historian. He wrote a book called uh, Wafa al-Wafa. He is uh, Nur al-Din ibn Ali al-Samhudi. So he was part of the committee for repairing the inside wall of the hujra. So he entered and he saw it and he described it and measured it. And it's basically somewhere like three and a half feet by like four and a half feet. That was how big it was, which was originally or the smaller part of the room of Aisha later on. And he said it was put, covered with red sand, like a very like red, fine red sand. And the, the, the ground level inside the hujra was like 60 centimeters lower than outside of it. So it's a li- even lower than the rest of the masjid. And he says that the three graves, you can barely see them يعني, above the ground. They're almost level with the ground. And the highest one, a little bit, was what he perceived to be the grave of Umar. Radiallahu anhu. So this was the last person to enter and give an eyewitness account. And it also happens to be a historian who wrote a book and basically preserved all this information for us. Sallallahu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.